Hey all and welcome to another video. Today we are going to be talking about obstructive uropathy. Quick channel plug, um, we have kind of tried to uh, further develop our channel and take things to the next level. We've uh, put a subscribe button in the bottom right corner so if you like our content you want to follow along uh, for what we hope is going to be a continued plethora of free open access medical education um, YouTube videos. Feel free to hit that subscribe button. In addition to that, um, to kind of further, further our goals of getting new equipment and developing this channel, we actually have started a Patreon page. It's linked in the video comments so if you want to get involved in that way, uh, we obviously would love to have you there. Um, there's some special perks there and some merchandise as well, if that's interesting to you. Okay, so obstructive uropathy. Why are we talking about this? Well, it's actually a spinoff from our first case conference. That's case conference number one. You can find that on our channel. I'll actually link it in the video description as well as included in the top right corner right here. Um, those case conferences are real patient cases that us at Whiteboard Doctor have cared for in the past. And that first case that we posted was actually a case of obstructive uropathy. So this is kind of the spinoff of that to talk about the illness itself. When talking about obstructive uropathy, it's actually a fairly broad topic. So to narrow in on it, we are going to talk about it in general in terms of anatomy, differential diagnosis, um, and management. And then we're going to hone in a little bit on distal urinary tract obstruction, UTO, leading to bilateral hydronephrosis. Okay? So again, we'll talk about the broad topic of obstructive uropathy, um, but we are going to talk in more detail about distal urinary tract obstruction leading to bilateral hydronephrosis. So what is obstructive uropathy? Well, the first word here is obstruct obstructive, right? It's causing an obstruction somewhere in the general urinary tract, and then uropathy, renal dysfunction. So it's an obstruction somewhere in the general urinary tract leading to renal dysfunction. Urinary tract obstruction in general is actually fairly common, right? Um, elderly males develop it often secondary to prostate hypertrophy or hyperplasia. Um, young children can develop it secondary to posterior urethral valves and congenital anomalies. Um, usually, though, it does not lead to any significant uropathy or acute kidney injury. Um, this, though, does occur, and when it does occur, it's really important to diagnose it, identify it, and manage it appropriately um, because the faster you res resolve the obstruction, the more apt those patients are to regain their normal renal function without any significant amount of uh, chronic kidney disease progressing. All right, so what do we see here? When talking about obstructive uropathy, um, I think it's important to think about the anatomy because the differential diagnosis is all driven on the anatomy. So we have our you know, two kidneys up at top here right? And then traveling down here, we have our two ureters, right? The ureters empty into this nice blue bladder, right? So our urine's from the kidneys down the ureter into the bladder, and then it travels through the urethra and out into the world. And that's plus or minus a prostate here, depending on obviously your gender. The other thing I do want to note here is that these ureters actually travel retroperitoneal. And that's important to note when we're thinking about differential. Um, so they travel down in the retroperitoneal space and actually go behind the bladder, posterior to the bladder, and insert on the posterior surface of the bladder. So how does that anatomy then relate to our differential diagnosis? Well, an obstruction is a physical ailment, right? Somewhere in this genitourinary system, there's an obstruction, and that's leading to backflow of urine. So when thinking about the differential, if we just think about the anatomy, that we, we then can come up with the differential. So down here, I've listed those four things, right? Kidney, ureter, bladder, urethra. And we're going to go through the different causes of obstruction in those anatomic areas. Um, there is a lot of crossover between them as well. So nephrolithiasis, stones in the kidney, are a huge cause of um, partial urinary tract obstruction. Same thing in the ureter, right? A stone can travel from the kidney into the ureter. It often gets lodged in this ureto um, vesicular junction right here where the ureters meet the bladder, and it can cause backflow of urine and partial hydro or, uh, unilateral hydronephrosis and partial obstruction. It can also get lodged in the urethra. The differences here are in the kidney, it's a unilateral hydronephrosis or partial obstruction. Same in the ureter, unless you coincidentally had two stones. In the urethra, though, it is going to be bilateral, right? Because if a stone gets lodged right here, it's going to cause the backflow of urine, right, up into the bladder and then into both kidneys. So in the ureter, nephrolithiasis causes bilateral hydronephrosis. All right, beyond stones, what else can occur? Well, we actually can get slothing of 
the renal papillae, so the kind of structure of the kidney itself, that tissue sloths off and clogs the nephrons. Um, and that can actually then travel down into the ureter, just like a stone could, and cause unilateral hydronephrosis and a partial urinary tract obstruction. All right. Beyond that, as with many things, cancer can cause a partial obstruction in the kidney. Um, it can cause, you know, both a partial obstruction and unilat er, and complete obstruction in the ureter. It can cause obstruction in the bladder, and it actually can cause compression and obstruction if it's, you know, well, uh, unfortunately placed in the urethra, right? So cancer in the kidney is unilateral uh, obstruction. Cancer in the ureter can be both. So we'll put U and B, cancer in the bladder. Um, it actually can be both as well because if the bladder cancer is sitting right over here, right, if we have a big, you know, cancer right here, that's going to lead to unilateral, whereas if it's in a different place, it can lead to bilateral, such as down by the urethra, right, if we had a big cancer over here. All right. And then in the urethra, it's going to be bilateral. What else? So that's all the things in the kidneys, but what else in the ureter, bladder, and urethra? So in the ureter, fibrosis. Something we hear about is retroperitoneal fibrosis, right? We talked about how these ureters travel through the retroperitoneal space. So if you get fibrosis in the retroperitoneal space, it's going to cause strictures in the ureters, which can be unilateral or bilateral and obviously can lead to obstruction because those ureters are not passing urine through at their full capacity, the capacity that the kidneys are used to. So fibrosis in the ureters can... Um, and then this is something that's, you know, applicable to many of these, but I'm going to divide it up a little bit. So infection and inflammation, right? And often the inflammation is caused by infection, but infection and inflammation can lead to swelling, and swelling can lead to you know, making the tube that is the ureters or the bladder or the urethra more narrow. And that can lead to then obstruction because urine can't pass through it. All right. And these, again, can be unilateral if it's in the ureters. But most of the time, you know, it's going to be bilateral, right? All right. And then some other things that you might think about, blood, right? If we get blood that clogs the ureter, or if we get blood that clogs the bladder, and this, oh, I wrote bladder instead of blood. And this blood that's in the bladder, you know, really causes a, a, an obstruction when you get a big blood clot that kind of sits right down here in front of the urethra. So I'm going to put in the bladder section, but it's really kind of clogging the proximal portion of the urethra that's causing an issue, right? And then for the urethra, another thing specific to that is stricture. If the urethra is narrowed, if there's a stricture for any reason. The only other thing kind of to note under bladder is a neurologic bladder dysfunction, right? Uh, this can be from peripheral or central nervous system, um, you know, the sphincter muscles or the detrusor muscle that causes contraction of the bladder if you get urinary retention from neurologic complications. Um, it can lead to bladder obstruction, all right? And then again, these would be bilateral, bilateral, and then blood can be either unilateral or bilateral, all right? So this is a fairly kind of good list here of the different anatomic etiologies of obstruction, both for unilateral and bilateral. Unilateral is also, you know, known as partial obstruction, whereas bilateral is known as complete obstruction. And in this case, we're going to focus primarily on complete obstruction when we talk about kind of the pathophysiology, symptoms, signs, labs, etc. Okay, so how does obstruction lead to acute kidney injury, or AKI? Well, several things actually happen. So 
when we get obstruction, right, there is a distal obstruction that causes kind of a backflow of urine, and that increases the pressure in the nephron. And that pressure is then reflected into the glomerulus, and here we have the afferent arterial, right, that brings blood to the glomerulus, and here we have the efferent, which takes blood away. So what happens is that we tend to get this, what, we, uh, what I'm going to call backflow of urine. And it's really not backflow, it's more like an inability for forward flow. That reduces your glomerular, filt uh, glomerular filtration rate, right? Because this is a pressure gradient to get blood from the glomerulus and filter that blood into the nephron, there has to be you know, lower pressure in the nephron and higher pressure in the glomerulus. So if you have increasing pressure in the nephron, you're going to have less fluid coming out of the glomerulus into the nephron, right? And that reduced uh, glomerular filtration rate actually causes the kidney to do something that might seem counterintuitive. It vasoconstricts the afferent arterial. So it, it makes this arterial vasoconstrict. Now why would it do that? Because that's going to decrease blood flow to the glomerulus. Well, we have two kidneys, right? And if one kidney is struggling, that kidney says, well, I'm going to constrict my afferent arterial to shunt blood over to the other kidney. And in this case, the kidney is assuming the other kidney is healthy. Now, if you have a complete, if you have an incomplete or partial obstruction and the other kidney is doing okay, let's say you have kind of a big stone here right at the ureteral vesicular junction, you get backflow of the urine, hydronephrosis, and that afferent arterial vasoconstricts and it shunts blood over to the good kidney, then that makes sense. The body's going to be happy because that kidney can pick up the slack and do the job. But if let me delete those arrows. If you have bilateral, a bilateral obstruction, let's say that you have a stone that's hugely lodged in the urethra and you're getting backflow into both kidneys, then both those kidneys are going to vasoconstrict their afferent, afferent arterial and there's going to be nowhere for the blood to go. What happens when we constrict our afferent arterial is you actually cause ischemia with the kidneys, right? Because the kidney is made out of cells and tissues, just like other organs. And if those tissues and organs aren't getting blood, you're going to get ischemia in the kidney. That ischemia then leads to inflammation. And what happens when we have inflammation? What is inflammation? That's a immune kind of response to the low blood flow. And that immune response is going to then lead to the inflammation right, which is just a generic term for, you know, all the uh, things the immune system secretes that usually kill invaders. And that is going to lead to remodeling of the kidney nephron remodeling and interstitium. That remodeling will eventually then lead to interstitial fibrosis. And this is a process, right? Once you get to interstitial fibrosis, there's kind of no resolving that. But if you can intervene at an earlier moment, right, a moment here or even a moment here, that can actually lead to full recovery of all kidney function. Whereas if you are already remodeling and you start to intervene here, you're already too late because you're already developing that fibrosis. Okay, so that's kind of the pathophysiology of how you develop acute kidney injury and obstruction. Now, if it's only a partial or unilateral obstruction, that other kidney can usually pick up most of the slack. Now, if you have chronic kidney disease in that other kidney, you might see an elevated creatinine because that other kidney can't pick up all the slack because it's already you know chronically ill. But most of the time, if it's just a partial obstruction, you won't actually see acute kidney injury. All right, so signs and symptoms. Interestingly, there are usually not many symptoms. So pain is kind of a late finding. Pain is something that occurs if we have significant bladder distension, which would mean that you had to have a distal complete urinary tract obstruction that causes the bladder to be distended.
if it's a partial, you know, from something like retroperitoneal fibrosis, you actually might not get much pain. Um, you might get a little pain if you get stretching of the capsule, the kidney, um, but otherwise, unless you have significant bladder distension, infection, right, which can cause pain. So if you have an infection that's leading to inflammation and edema, and thus, you know, a swelling of the bladder outlet or urethra leading to bladder distension and obstruction, or if you have a stone, right, because stones cause irritation and inflammation. Otherwise, patients might have not have any pain at all. The other thing you think about is urine output. Um, are these patients going to come and say, hey, doc, I haven't been urinating? Well, there's a lot of variability. And again, it depends on where the obstruction is. If they have a complete obstruction distal to their bladder, right, kind of by their bladder outlet here, and they can't pass any urine past it, then yeah, they might not be urinating. But otherwise, they might get things like frequency or urgency, which results from their entire bladder filling up and then they get overflow incontinence that that pressure in the bladder, right? Again, let's say you have BPH and your urethra gets so small that it actually closes together. If you get a huge pressure buildup in the bladder, eventually that pressure will get high enough to push a little bit of urine out and that's overflow incontinence that the bladder gets so full that it's able to overcome that stricture just a little bit. Once that pressure decreases in the bladder, then that uh, uh, stricture kind of uh, recloses together. And stricture isn't totally the right word, but that urethra that's swollen um, or compressed closes back up. Some patients, if it's really bad, will get anuria where they won't pee. The case conference we talked about was a gentleman who actually said he hadn't peed in two days because he had such a significant obstruction. Um, but many times these patients may be asymptomatic. And they usually only get symptomatic if they have severe disease, severe enough to lead to symptoms. Now, what signs might they have? This is where it gets tricky as well. You know, if you have a patient with a stone, they might have flank pain, right? If you have a patient with infection, they might get dysuria or burning when they pee or, you know, frequency, urgency, those kinds of things. But, you know, these are all complaints. Are they going to have objective findings on exam? They might have objective flank pain, but only if they have a stone. If not, they won't. Um, some of them, if they have severe disease, may have signs of fluid overload, bilateral lower extremity edema, you know, crackles on exam. But you have to have a severe, complete obstruction to get that. Otherwise, many of these patients, um, you know, again, they might have suprapubic fullness if their bladder is completely full. But it depends on if their obstruction is complete, distal to the bladder, and has led to that. Otherwise, these patients may have, you know, no signs, no physical exam findings to suggest that they have, uh, you know, partial um, or unilateral obstruction, or even complete obstruction that's early in the course. So it's a tricky diagnosis to make on clinical exam alone. If we are suspicious of it, let's say it's, you know, a gentleman with known BPH that has had uh, frequency and overflow incontinence for two days, and they look mildly fluid overload and have a palpable bladder, how do we work them up? Well, from a lab standpoint, we're going to want to know what their kidney function is, right? So we're going to get a basic metabolic panel, which has a creatinine and a BUN. In addition to that, our kidneys regulate our electrolytes, right? So we're also going to want a magnesium and a FOS with our BMP, which will give us sodium, potassium, chloride, as well as bicarb. If they have kidney injury, a blood gas can be useful to get the pH because if they have kidney injury, they might have a low bicarb and be acidotic, and that's good to verify. We're also going to want a urinalysis. The urinalysis often in obstructive uropathy will either have just a little bit of blood or a few white blood cells, which is pyuria. We also want to make sure there is no infection because if there is an infection, you know, based on symptoms in the UA, then we obviously will want to treat it. If they have an elevated creatinine, you're also going to want a urine sodium, urine urea, urine creatinine, and urine um, no, that's actually it. I don't have any other urine. Uh, the reasons you want this, and there are soft call, I won't talk more about it, but um, you can calculate things like the FENA and the FE urea. So let's scroll over here just for a, a quick FENA FE urea discussion. So the FENA in 
Obstructive uropathy, the FENA all often starts at less than 1%. That is actually a pre-renal FENA, right? Which implies that there's not enough blood flow. And even though it's obstructive, that's true, right? Because as we talked about, when you start to get this backflow urine pressure, you get afferent arterial vasoconstriction leading to ischemia, as we talked about. As time goes on, though, that FENA is actually going to start to get higher and higher because what's happening then is you're transitioning into this intrinsic phase, right, where you get inflammation, remodeling fibrosis of the actual interstitium. So the FENA isn't very helpful because if it's early, it might be low. If it's later, it might be high. If it's somewhere in between, who knows? Same with FE urea. So although, you know, textbook answer for any acute kidney injury is always to send these, um, in this case, these are, you know, of very limited value. All right. What else do you want in the workup? So that's your lab workup. You've now detected that the patient does have a, you know, elevated BUN and creatinine, a little hyperkalemia, a little acidosis with acidemia on their VBG. Their urinalysis just has a flu blood cells and small blood and their, you know, FENA is 2%. So what do you want to do now? Well, if their story, you know, is concerning for obstructive uropathy, and I would make an argument, you know, my workup for acute kidney injury usually involves um, imaging the kidneys no matter what, but some would argue that it's unnecessary. But in this case, if there's any suspicious suspicion at all from history or physical, get a renal ultrasound and a bladder ultrasound. On here, you're going to be looking for, right, hydronephrosis or swelling of the kidneys. The hydronephrosis can also, you know, tell you if it's unilateral or bilateral, which can be helpful, right? Because that'll narrow down your differential, as we talked about. If it's, you know, unilateral, you might suspect some of these unilateral etiologies. If it's bilateral, you have these other bilateral etiologies. It also can show you, you know, the kind of renal cortex and how thin it is, because that can give you an indication of duration. If it's chronic and there's been an obstruction for a significant amount of time, you're going to get thinning of that, and that can give you some uh, uh, insight into prognosis, which we'll talk about below. All right. If there's suspicion, uh, bladder ultrasound, if the bladder is really distended, then you know there's a more distal obstruction that's leading to the bladder being full, and you can insert a Foley catheter. If there's concern for a stone or any, you know, pathology making you worried about, you know, retroperitoneal pathology, which isn't picked up well on ultrasound or cancer, um, a CT scan, abdomen pelvis, you could do a renal protocol without contrast. Because if you do contrast, the contrast can get into the urinary system and it actually can make it so you can't see the stone. So CT scan, renal protocol, no contrast um, to evaluate for stone or retroperitoneal, retroperitoneal or cancer. But uh, the vast majority of cases you are, you know, pretty much A-OK -okay with renal ultrasound and bladder ultrasound um, when working this up from an imaging standpoint. All right. So you now have a gentleman. He had a little fluid overload. He wasn't urinating. Um, his bladder was full. Um, you got labs. He has an acute kidney injury with a little hyperkalemia to 5.2, a little acidosis. He has a little blood in his urine. His fien is 2% unhelpful. His renal ultrasound, though, shows bilateral hydronephrosis uh, with a bladder ultrasound with two liters of urine in his bladder. So how do we manage this? Well, the number one thing in management is decompress. So whatever is, you know, obstructed, decompress it. In this case, if it's a distal obstruction, right, you're going to want to place a Foley catheter. If you can't place a Foley catheter, you know, let's say the urethra is so compressed by the prostate or infection or edema that you can't place it, you should call urology to try. If they can't, you actually would need a suprapubic Foley, which they insert through the belly into the bladder. And if you couldn't do that, you would actually need nephrostomy tubes, tubes that you place directly into the kidneys to decompress the kidneys because you have to decompress. That's the only way to start to allow the kidneys to recover. All right. You can do some other things depending on where the obstruction is. Obviously, if it's partial and it's a kidney stone and it's large enough and it's not going to pass on its own, you can call urology for lithotripsy, give them fluids, that kind of thing. Um, but in this case, we're going to talk about kind of distal complete obstruction. Um, so once you decompress, 
through one of these modalities, you do want to think of why, right? Why do they have the obstruction? So if they have a urinalysis that looks infected, you obviously want to treat that because that can lead to inflammation, edema in the bladder outlet or urethra leading to urinary retention. If you are obstructed, you also are more inclined to develop infections and you can get really, really sick because you're not you know, passing urine through so bacteria can build up in the urine. So you do want to treat aggressively both because it can be a cause of urinary tract obstruction and obstructive uropathy as well as a, a complication of it. In addition to that, if you think it's from BPH, Things like alpha-1 adrenergic blockers, right? These are tamsulosin adrenergic blockers, such as tamsulosin can be helpful, right? What these do, if we remember, is that they relax smooth muscle in the bladder, neck, and prostate and allow urine to pass through better so they can help relieve that obstruction, all right? And beyond that, you really need to decompress figure out why they were obstructed, and try to address that causal etiology. Once you do that, the big thing to monitor is for post-obstructive diuresis, which we're actually going to put out a video on that in the coming days, so we're not going to dive into it here because it's a really interesting topic and kind of will take a little bit of time to discuss. So um, those interested, look for a video. It'll be good. All right. So now we've diagnosed this gentleman with obstructive uropathy, uh, secondary to bladder outlet obstructive or urethral obstruction, most likely secondary to BPH. We put in a Foley catheter and decompressed him. His urine does not look infected. We started an alpha blocker and we're monitoring for post-obstructive diuresis. What is his prognosis? Prognosis is highly dependent on time to decompression and if he has any history of chronic kidney disease. So most of these patients, if you decompress them within about seven days, they can get almost complete recovery. But if it takes longer than that, or if they have chronic kidney disease, they might have residual injury to their kidneys and worsening of their CKD. But the prognosis overall, if you decompress them in a timely manner, can be, can be you know, very, uh, very promising. All right, so that's all I got for you today on obstructive diuresis, specifically distal urinary tract outlet obstructed causing bilateral hydronephrosis and acute kidney injury. Um, hope that was helpful and valuable. Let us know what thoughts you have down below, uh, questions, comments, concerns. Check out that case conference if you want to see the original case that uh, uh, sparked this discussion, and uh, we will see you all next time. Don't forget post-obstructive diuresis, future video. Thanks, guys.